Some our of program is computer. All right. Good morning. Go. Good morning. Thanks for meeting with me, Sarah. Um, if you want to take a minute or two and just talk a little bit about yourself, um, sure. that would be awesome. Can do that. Uh, my name is Sarah Close. I graduated uh, with my undergrad degree in 1997, and I've been in real estate ever since in some capacity or another. Uh, and I'm currently getting a master's at Thomas Jefferson University in sustainable construction and design. Awesome. Thank you. So we're going to talk about sustainable building and really what does sustainable building mean? What is green building? There's a lot of questions out there. I um, just want to kind of maybe clarify it a little if we can. Sure. So what is sustainable building? That is a, a huge question. I will say that the the short answer is that um, it is reducing or eliminating your carbon footprint. So um, sustainable building and design is doing everything you can, whether it's reusing materials, uh, or using materials that are resilient or um, reproducible, um, making good use of the land, not polluting, um, doing whatever you can to be more efficient. Uh, so reducing the carbon footprint or eliminating what you can. Okay, awesome. And then what is green building? Green building, again, means a lot of things to a lot of different people, but using sustainable products, um, using, you know, woods that happen to be plentiful in the area that you live, using local resources, um, making good use of the land, making sure that you're uh, planting things in appropriate areas, that you're not using invasive species, that you're making good use of the water. Um, that you are um, not using products that emit a lot of off gases or create carbon for years to come. So there's awesome. a lot of elements to that. Perfect. Um, what inspired you to start getting involved in this sort of building? I think, you know, when I started flipping houses or and selling real estate in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, uh, most of the buildings in the inner city are late 1800s, early 1900s, and they have some really great bones. They have um, a lot of things that I wanted to keep or reuse or repurpose. So I think it started that way um, in, you know, finding the beauty in the old um, marked up, scarred elements um, and you know, if it can be reused or repurposed and not thrown away, uh, that's that's really important. That's awesome. Um, what are the four key principles of sustainability? Um, performance is the first one. And performance means the performance of the building. How much daylight can you get in? Do you need to have shading? Um, where can the building be positioned most efficiently on the, uh, on the property, on the site? Um, you know, where can the windows open so you can get a cross breeze, that sort of that first performance uh, quadrant. The second would be systems. What systems are you using? Um, what's your water system like? Are you using uh, solar hot water? Are you using a well for landscaping? Are you using an efficient HVAC system? Are you using LED lights? That sort of that quadrant would be systems. Um, culture, you know, what are the values in your area or the values of your company? If you're doing a, com you know, a commercial project, what, what do you want to see? Is it inner city? Do you want interaction with the neighborhood? Um, you know, if you're out in the country, do you want, um, to encourage wildlife, um, or a certain species of tree that you want to see reproduced? So that's the culture. What's important to the, the client or the surrounding um, community. And the last is experience. And experience is more, how do people feel when they enter the building? What can they see? What can they smell? What can they touch? Uh, is it, do, do we wanna 
be welcoming? Are there materials we can use to keep the building cooler so they feel um, they feel cool even if the AC is not on? You know, how, how does the human body and mind react to the building? That's more of the experience quadrant. Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry, you made a great point in our live discussion about uh, the dorms. And um, can you talk a little bit about that, about the concrete walls and prison-like yes. aspect of a dorm? Yes. So that's, you know, uh, and new dorms are being built all the time. And to be honest, um, dorms are still way better now than they were when I was uh, <laughs> in college. But they, you know, dorms tend to have, the old school dorms have concrete walls and they're painted and they're painted with a, a shiny paint that's easily scrubbable. Uh, if there's drywall at all, you know, you're not allowed to put nails in it. That's a whole different thing. Um, but it can be very prison like a lot of them have one window or, um, you know, there, there aren't a lot of finishes. So to make them feel warm and cozy or like people want to be there is, is a challenge. Now, that really also varies campus to campus because I, I feel like you know, you have private schools versus public schools and some have more funding or had to tear their old buildings down and are building new ones. So uh, they really vary greatly. But um, experience, like if we're looking at the experience quadrant, the story that I told was I stayed in my son's dorm um, when we were touring that campus. And at night, they had flimsy blinds on the window, the one window in the dorm room where the bed was and there was a safety light outside a pole with a light on it because students have to be safe when they're coming and going from other dorms or the library but that light shone in the window and it made it really difficult to sleep um you know there are easy fixes for that better blinds a, a blackout curtain something like that but that's um you know uh an example of an element that, that could be changed if if someone was going through the four quadrants and perhaps making a checklist. Sure. Absolutely. Which I think is makes sense in any area, right? Yes. Um, what are some of the most important features or technologies you incorporate into your sustainable homes? So I would say the, the first thing that I try and incorporate that isn't really even an element is I try and reuse everything I can. You know, anything that you reuse, first of all, stays out of the landfill. But secondly, it has already emitted all of its uh, off gases. You know, uh, new materials, when they come in, you know, emit carbon for a certain amount of time. And also there is the fossil fuels we use to get them from point A to point B. Or if things are mined or chopped down, there's energy involved in that. So reuse, I think, is is number one. Um when I'm remodeling uh, or flipping something, I try to go the route most often of the less expensive, easier ways that we can get the best bang for our buck. Those things being um, the extra insulation or the more expensive insulation product or solar or uh, on-demand gas, hot water are both going to be far more efficient and they're not very expensive. Um, using well water for outside planting if possible. Um, making sure that you have the darker blinds or shades on the sides of the house that are very sunny and perhaps the sheer ones on the sides that could use more light using LED lights. Um, you know, those are all easy, you know, water saving appliances or shower heads, you know, those are all really easy ways and not very expensive ways to make a huge difference in the long run. Absolutely. Um, how do you ensure that your homes are energy efficient? By doing those things. I mean, okay. you know, you, you do what you can. Um, and we talked know, about in rentals, like what are some things that students can do or people that are in rentals can do? Maybe not, you're not building a house, but there's some everyday things that we can all do to make our house a little bit more energy efficient. Right. Well, in the case of cold areas, you know, you can turn your heat down, you can put on a sweater or wool socks, warm areas, you know, open the windows and get a ceiling fan. Um, if the, if it's weather appropriate, um, water saving shower heads and, uh, new aerators for, you know, the kitchen and bathroom sinks, um, making sure lights are turned off or switching to LED bulbs is a big one. Um, one of the things I didn't mention in the class that is important 
if you were renting um a lot of municipalities not all but larger ones most certainly if you call the the power company the electric company they have programs where someone will meet you at the house and say you could do x y and z you could change your filters more often um in your hvac system or you could change out this lighting or um i know that some areas have um programs energy company electric company programs where if you agree to only use your washer and dryer after 8 p.m., you get a huge break on the price. So I would uh, encourage everybody, especially if they live in a town of any size or a city, to contact their local energy company and ask if someone can come out and do an audit. Okay, that's great. And then um, what materials do you prioritize in the construction? And I know you talk about reusing um, you talked mm -hmm. about framing out old windows and using them again to find the beauty and imperfection. But are there any other materials that you like to use in construction when you're working? I like to use natural materials if I can. I know that, for example, uh, you know, the luxury vinyl plank um, LVP is really big right now. It has its place. It's great if you have kids. It's great if you have pets. Um I like to use natural wood if I can. It's renewable, it's sustainable. <clears throat> if it does end up in a landfill, it will deteriorate and, and decompose. Um, so, you know, those are the types of things. If I can get light fixtures and, and paint them cool old light fixtures, again, that's a reuse thing. Um, I try to use better insulation. Um, I try and use a lot of weather stripping, make sure everything is tight. So if you have to turn on that, your HVAC system, it works the most efficiently, um, things like that. So, but I like natural materials, anything that, um, comes from the earth, uh, or, or occurs naturally is going to create a more biophilic or natural feel. Okay. That's awesome. Um, what locations around the world have you um, seen the most sustainable building like occur? I th yeah, I think you know warmer climates tend to have um, a better time. Yes, you have humidity and that can sometimes affect different materials and can create mold and mildew. But in warmer climates, especially in developing countries, they're not used to HVAC. So, um, you know, they they have cross breezes and they sort of automatically will position their buildings and their windows in order to get a better cross breeze. Um, they tend to, um, do, if they, you know, they use a lot of natural lighting as opposed to electric. Um, so, you know, it depends on the, on the place. Um, but I think that warmer climates have it a little bit easy. You also in colder climates have expansion and contraction of materials because there's such an extreme hot and an extreme cold. Sure. Um, and that's harder on an envelope, a building envelope. It's harder on the sheathing. It's harder on the wood. It's harder on the tile, um, than a warmer climate. So, um, and I think that, you know, developing countries in warmer climates have a lot to offer and teach us about their methods and how they do things. And I think we have to be really conscientious of, you know, listening and taking that in before we do things in those places. Awesome. Um, how do you approach water conservation and management in your projects? Sure. Well, there's a couple of, of ways to do that. You know, we talked about the water saving appliances, whether it's your washing machine or dishwasher, um, water saving shower heads are easy to swap out or new aerators on sinks. Um, but also there's, there's two things there's, that's sort of a two tiered question. One is if you're living in, um, an area that gets a lot of water, you can, uh, put rain barrels, um, at the end of your gutter system. So you can water your garden, you can water your flower beds, you can, that's water capture, right? Um, if if you live in a place, for example, the Outer Banks that floods a lot, um, you can dig a ditch or what we call a swale, um, and that will collect the water and prevent flooding in many cases that you have this ditch in, you know, on the perimeter of your house. Um, rain gardens are another thing. So 
both swales and rain gardens. Rain gardens are smaller. Swales are more of a long property edge type of a, a situation. But, you know, there are certain um, native plants and grasses and flowers that you can grow in those areas that actually help absorb some of that extra water, um, depending on where you live. Uh, up north, for example, it's willow trees are, are big. You know, they suck up a lot of water and they prevent things from getting flooded. Um, if you want to reuse water, it, you know, if you live in a, a place that you can dig a well and, and use that for your irrigation system on your lawn so you don't have to use city water, that's important. Um, one thing that I've learned a lot about recently, uh, because I have a friend that heads a program at the University of Minnesota, is keeping drains clean around your house, keeping not just the drains inside your house, but uh, the sewer drains um, a lot of times, especially in big cities, they get clogged up or they get full of debris, whether it's litter or leaves and pine needles. It, you have to keep those clean in order to prevent flooding. So if you have those in your neighborhood to go around and make sure that nothing's blocking them is important. When you walk around your neighborhood, that's something I've never mm -hmm. even thought about. Yeah. Putting the sewer drains. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. So these little tips, you know. Um, how do you in integrate uh, renewable energy sources like solar or wind power into your designs? Um, well, so wind power, I don't know as much about. I know wind turb turbines are becoming quieter. They used to be a little noisy and people didn't like them in residential areas. Um, I see them used in businesses more often. Um, solar, the easiest way and most cost friendly way to do solar at the moment would be solar hot water um, in like a, a black rubber bladder system that kind of sits on a roof. You'll see that a lot. It's easy to install. Um, it, solar, the big cost of solar is installation. If you're getting big panels put on your roof, um, the install and making sure that things don't leak and uh, it can be a little tricky is it cost effective? How long will it take you to get your money back? Um, those things need to be taken into consideration. Um, in some places, you can have a few batteries to use solar and to store it. Larger municipalities, a lot of times, if you have extra solar, it will go back into the grid and the, comp the electric company will actually pay you to uh if they for whatever they use that you don't use that goes back into the grid so those are all considerations what i focus on are the smaller things generally speaking i'll do solar hot water or um, on demand gas hot water is mm -hmm. if you have gas where you live it's, it's another huge energy saver um electric hot water on demand is available as well. You have to make sure in your area that you have enough power coming from the pole outside because when they turn on, it takes a lot of energy to start them to begin with. But um, on demand hot water is, is a big one and solar hot water, good insulation, um, those types of things I focus on. Okay. And then can you share examples of innovative or unconventional sustainability solutions you've implemented in your projects? Um, well, a lot of it, you know, comes in the form of reuse. If I'm reusing materials to create a new backsplash or, um, you know, using a, a funky old copper bowl as a sink or things like, you know, I, I, I tend to do those types of things. Um, ex I, I'm trying to think of examples off the top of my head. It's yeah, the sink is cool. I like the one about the uh, windows, like taking the windows and using them to make mirrors or something else out of them. I think that's really yes, cool. Yes, yes. And I've used, you know, old tin roofs from one house to to make backsplashes in another house. Yeah, or I've taken, you know, window trim. If, if the windows can't be saved and I have to put in more energy efficient windows, I'll save some trim and I'll, you know, I'll use it in another part. I'll frame out the bathroom mirrors with it. Things like that. Right. Um, so a lot of people don't think about like, I'm getting my windows replaced. What will they do with my old windows? Yes. They take them with them. And what, what do they do with them? Do they repurpose right. them? Do they put them in, you know, maybe a house that someone just can't even afford windows? You know what I mean? Like what, what happens to those windows? So, right. It, it depends on what they are. A lot of them end up in the landfill. I will tell yeah. you that there's a huge market. If you have windows that are wood 
for artists. Art you will if you put them on some local Facebook page or next door and you have old wooden windows, um, I guarantee an artist somewhere will use them for a project. Or, you know, another thing uh, I've seen them used for that's great, you could use wood ones or vinyl. If you have old vinyl windows that just aren't efficient anymore, people make greenhouses out of them to start their plants before planting season. And those can be really fun. And there's a okay. million plans online about how yeah. to use old windows to build a greenhouse. You can find- Check out Pinterest, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So how do you assess the overall environmental impact of your projects from like construction to the long term operation? I know you said that there was a uh, an online calculator, but what would the average person use that calculator for? Like, what are they looking for to do? Like, how are they? Planning? I would say if you're if you're buying materials um, for for a project, if, if you live in the home or you're remodeling. Right. Um if you want to know the difference between one insulation and another or windows or another, and you can do those material by material, or you can, you know, go down the list and what they call the building envelope, which is the whole building, um, you know, the sheathing, the siding, the roofing material, you know, you, there's a calculator that will say, okay, um, here's your environmental score. If okay. you do it this way, and here's gotcha. your environmental score if you do it that way, or if you use these materials. Okay. Um, so if you're if you're remodeling and you just want to know insulation, well, this insulation will save you this many kilowatts of power a year, or um, you know, these windows, you know, will make your HVAC run less often. I mean, it, you know, some of these calculators get specific even to the brand of the material. Not okay. just, you know, what's the R value of the insulation, but what's the R value of this brand of insulation? Okay, that's or, good to know. Or like spray insulation versus blown in versus the batting with the sure. brown paper on it. Well, it's hard to know too, when you're remodeling something, what is the best, you know, um, item to pick? And then we buy things on Amazon and all these big companies and we have no clue, like the wood has like chemicals that the, 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 um, the mattresses have all these chemicals in them. And then, you know, obviously that's an issue. And yet we don't even know that what we're purchasing. Um, right. So I feel like the consumer is kind of clueless a lot of times as to the environmental factors of everyday items that we're purchasing online. I think that's true. And I think that one of the things that people don't, one of the things that would be real surprising to people is that once you get this thing, right, whether it's a mattress or a new bed frame, or uh, an armoire, that it's not just the electricity that they use to make that product, but it's the water they use to make that product. It is the chemicals that they put in that product. It's the truck that they used with the gas or the diesel in it to ship it, uh, or the airplane or whatever cargo ship um it's the plastic bubble wrap to wrap that item yeah yeah so, and that's there's why so I'm much big bubble wrap that's why i'm big on the reusing but but the other element of that that people don't know a lot about is then the emission of the carbon that happens after that for example one of the ones i didn't i didn't realize concrete you can pour concrete and it emits a carbon gas for years and years wow. So people just don't know that they don't realize that the, the products that they're buying are emitting these off gases, this carbon for years into the future. So right. you have the chemical part, and then you have what's it doing to the atmosphere once you unwrap it or pour it or install right. it in your house. Those are two completely different elements, but they both, inf you know, they both affect our health in different ways. Sure. Absolutely. Um, have you noticed any trends or advancements in sustainable home construction over the last few years? Yes. Um, solar is becoming less expensive, and I believe that eventually it will become less expensive to install or it will become more easily available for a homeowner to install themselves, ideally, or, you know, to have Joe down the street help you install it. And that right. would be great. Um 
I think that one of the trends I'm seeing in materials that I mentioned in the class was like, for example, hempcrete, uh, which is way stronger than concrete. It is made, uh, it's a zero carbon. In fact, it's, it's what's called a carbon sink. So it actually um, absorbs carbon because it's made from hemp. That's um, cool. it, 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 so that's called a carbon sink. Uh, it's, it's better than neutral. And it doesn't emit the the gases after the fact. It actually grabs on. Um, so th those materials, th I mean, there's a lot of innovative. There are new styrofoam blocks that they can, you can make a commercial building from these blocks that look like concrete blocks, but they're made out of um, recyclable plastics. And they're wow. very strong. And you can pack mud or dirt into them or pour hempcrete or some kind of concrete. You know, it depends on you know what you're using them for, but some of these innovative products are really exciting. It's a matter of getting them in the hands of local contractors and consumers sure. and letting your local municipality and the people that run the show as far as pulling permits know that these products are as good, if not better, than the traditional products that they're seeing. They're just as strong. Um, they're just as resistant to rot and they're better for the environment and therefore um, should be able to be used. So I think the big hurdle is just getting these things on the books or or educating the, the inspectors and the people that um, pull the permits or, or that are in charge of the permits once they're pulled, letting them know what is available. Okay, that's awesome. Um, so what do you think this degree in, in this degree, what will you do with this degree? What are your, what are your hopes for this degree that you're pursuing? My hope is to work for a non-government organization, an NGO or a nonprofit, an NPO, um, overseas in a developing country or many developing countries overseeing, um, local projects, um, and helping local organizations, um, build things like schools and hospitals or or wells for clean water in a way that respects their culture and respects their environment and uses materials that are as local and sustainable as possible. Um, I'd like to be involved in that, um, getting, you know, anything we can do to help these developing countries, you know, safer medic have safer medical facilities or more schools um, for kids to be educated or clean water. Um, you know, there's still a lot of places in the world where women and children mostly are walking five miles each way and carrying back five gallon jugs of water for the day for their cooking and cleaning. I think, um, yeah, it's important that we um, do what we can do to uh, you know, help Absolutely. in ways that we can help, but still respect that culture and environment. Yeah, that's awesome. And then um, as far as uh, flipping houses, tiny homes, RVs, all of that, um, I know there's some do's and don'ts um, and you've had a lot of experience in all those areas. So one or two pieces of advice for do's and don'ts in flipping homes. Flipping homes, I would say don't, make sure that you do what you can but don't over improve. So, you know, there's that, that middle ground. You don't want to put lipstick on a pig. You know, you don't want to slap up some paint and call it a day. Um, you want to make sure that you're doing quality work, but you also have to keep your price point of the buyers in mind. You know, a house that's going to resell for $6 million is going to require a different appliance package than a house that's going to sell for $500,000. So to be mindful of, of what you do, of making it as sustainable as you can within those perimeters. Sometimes I do things that cost a little bit more money because I sleep better at night. Maybe my profit margin might be not as great, but I'll do them anyway. Um, but you have to be careful not to over improve or under improve. Um, as far as the, the mobile type things like RVs, tiny houses, um, you're seeing, you know, since the pandemic, more and more of that, people traveling, people able to work from home, things like that. I would say uh, if you're going to build something like that or develop a com company that builds, you know, there are many tiny home companies now that that's all they do. 
is to make sure that you have the market to do that. Make sure that people have, uh, tiny houses are one of those things, interestingly, that are very hard to finance because they're not a car and they're not a home. So, and and if if they're an RV, they have to have a, a special RV stamp that makes them roadworthy. And that's a, that's a whole governmental process, right? So make sure they're going to be, um, either affordable or someone's going to be able to get a loan, make sure that they, that there's a market to put them somewhere or travel somewhere where, with them. There are a lot of places, RV parks that don't want tiny homes. There's a lot of campgrounds that won't allow them. You know, are you going to be somewhere where it's going to be permanent? And um, is that allowed? You know, if you buy a piece of land, are they going to allow you to live in a tiny home there? Or do they have, restrictions on what they consider mobile homes or square footage restrictions. So those are all things you have to keep in mind That's before awesome. starting a business or starting a build. Absolutely. Well, if anyone wants to get a hold of you, where can they find you? Uh, my website and Instagram and Facebook are saltwaterclose, all one word. My last name is close, saltwaterclose.com or just saltwaterclose on the social medias that I'm at my old age, willing and able to use, which are just Facebook and Instagram at this point. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. And thanks for being You're here welcome. today. If you, um, if you want to come back on and join me, that'd be awesome. Great. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks so much. Bye-bye. So All right. Bye-bye.